Yeah. Hello everybody, thank you very so much for coming and we've got the sunshine for you. So this is Dr Paul Cleave who's an honorary research fellow at the University of Exeter but of course it's the things that in some people's hearts, particularly Mark's, he's a food historian. So um, we're very much not just food but the social um, history behind food. So he very kindly comes and gives some very interesting lectures. And he came up with the title Cooking the Books <laughs> and has some lovely old cookbooks. So if you haven't noticed, we've had some people who couldn't come and they've asked to be filmed. But as you can see, Mark is filming <coughs> Paul and not yourselves. So <laughs> I didn't let you know just in case you needed to look the best. But um, well, if you love like to start, Paul, thank, thank you very you. much for coming. Thank you very much. Lovely to, to be here and a lovely afternoon. Um, as Sue was saying, when we were thinking about a, sort of a, a subject and a, a title, um, thought something that was food related, and then we came up with sort of cookery books. And I said, well, what about some cooking the books? <laughs> and um, some of the sort of collection of cookery books that I've um, acquired over the years, uh, I thought, well, look out some of those and just see some of these older books especially, whether there were little secrets, if you like, things hidden in them that we might use today. Some of them perhaps we wouldn't uh, wish to, but um, I'm sure everyone you know, in, in our kitchens, in our, those books that you go back to time and time again, yeah. maybe something that was your mother's or grandmother's, and then we're collecting recipes um, as we're shopping today, bombarded with programmes about food, um, cookery books, huge publication, um, but you know, it's part of a long history of, of publication uh, of recipes. You know, picked them up in a supermarket, um, this one sort of last week I picked up, the shortcut for haggis and lentil ragu. <laughs> some trends, taste change, and maybe that's what I'd like to um, look at this afternoon, maybe, is how, how tastes have changed and um, the ingredients that we use change over time. Um, and let's just have a look at some of the, if you like, some of the little secrets or the stories behind uh, the cookery books, um, because in a way they're they're more than a collection of, of recipes. And recipe, you could say, was a formula uh, for producing a, a dish or a particular preserve or whatever. But they are part of our social history. So what we're looking at are books probably within a span of two hundred years. So we'll sort of delve into those and see who's written them and uh, what stories um, there might be. I'm very grateful too for people uh, and friends who've passed books and material uh, on to me uh, for use in research and, and projects. Uh, and one in particular I've this afternoon from Battersea Polytechnic, uh, Cookery Recipes, that Anne passed on to me. Um, and it's again, it's interesting to see how people were we're taught to cook uh, at school. I think now we have lots of discussion about going back to some of those uh, practices that were very sound, gave people a good grounding uh, in cookery, uh, nutrition, um, and not wasting any food. So very grateful for that one. But the starting point I wanted um, to use today is um, a cookery book. I've taken off the dust cover because it was it's practically falling uh, to pieces and that's Judy's cookery book. Um, came across this uh, bookstore somewhere um, and Judy's cookery book uh, by Muriel Goldman. Has anyone heard of Muriel Goldman? No? I hadn't until I picked up the book um, and inside someone had um, left a, a cutting, a paper cutting. It's always very nice in some of yeah. these books if people leave something or they, they scribble something uh, about the book. Um, and the articles from the, um, the Western Times and Gazette for the 17th of October 1958. And a uh, portrait of a woman author. And she started with a cookery book. And Muriel Goman is rapidly gaining for herself a wide reputation as an author. Uh, although in North Devon she is still better known as Mrs Muriel Cox, 
former mayor of Biddeford, town councillor and magistrate. Well, uh, Muriel Goldman, it turns out, had uh, done her domestic science training at the Gloucester College, which was, I would imagine, in the 1920s, 1930s, which was the leading uh, establishment for cookery training, training domestic science teachers. And then in 1947, she published a cookery book for her daughter, Judy. Um, and this was really aimed at um, the girls of that age and that era, teaching them how to cook, how to help at home, um, and putting it in very, very understandable language. So uh, she starts off with a little um, a, a verse. Judy wants to learn to cook. First she takes her little book. Then she gets a pinafore hanging on the kitchen door. <laughs> Rolls her sleeves up neat and tight. Hands washed next, so clean and white. Ready now, this will be fun. Here you'll read how it's done. And then she goes on firstly to, to tell her, or instruct her how to make tea. Uh, and then maybe something for uh, breakfast, so sort of scrambled egg, poached eggs, bacon and fried bread. Then how to prepare dinner dishes and how to prepare a tea, uh, cakes and, and scones and um, custards and uh, puddings. And the books proved very, very popular, um, ran into several editions. This one so 1947, it was still pub being printed in 1955. And then she went on to produce another cookery book. So you had Judy's next cookery book. And she had a son, Michael, so she didn't leave him out. And then there were books for games for children and uh, activities for holidays. Um, so it's just, I think, a perhaps a slightly neglected uh, food writer uh, from Devon that uh, we ought to um, ought maybe um, consider. So, yes, we've got things sort of locally to look at. And when I was thinking about the presentation, I had a look at uh, my uh, grandmother's cookery book. And she'd given that to me a long, long, long time ago. I was just sort of thumbing through it, and her Mrs. Beaton's that her mother had, had given her, and she pasted lots of little notes and recipes in the book. And mm. it amused me really that um, there were instructions how to make mead, which sort of take seven pounds of honey, and then you went on to make the mead, how to cure a ham, and then uh, a remedy for exhaustion <laughs> <laughs> brandy and eggs uh, uh, and milk. But then, just as I got to the end of the book, she pasted in instructions for, she cut from a newspaper, um, a milk substitute. Um, put one tablespoon of coarse oatmeal into a jug and pour over it a pint of boiling water. Stir briskly, then strain through a wire sieve, then through a piece of muslin. This oatmeal milk uh, can be used in the same way as ordinary milk and no one would guess the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Buying and using oat milk uh, today, yeah. probably oh, yeah. 80, 90 years ago, yeah. it was a, a known substitute. If you think yeah. about it, yes, yeah, sort of, uh, find oatmeal does produce a sort of creamy white um, yeah. liquid. So <laughs> the yeah. secrets um, are, are in those, uh, those books. So before we just sort of dip into the bookshelf, this it's probably the oldest uh, book on the table today. Um, the cookery books probably evolved from manuscripts and recipes and instructions that eventually you know, were written by those that could write and then compiled into to volumes, sometimes linked to medicinal uh, practices uh, and work. But by the time this book was published, which is just to make give you the correct title, is the, uh, the Imperial uh, or Royal Cook, um, consisting of the most sumptuous made dishes, ragouts, fricassees, soups, gravies, etc., foreign and English, including the latest improvements in fashionable life. And this is a second edition, and it's by um, a celebrity chef, he would be known, known today, uh, Frederick Nutt. And he was a chef who had worked for the royal family um, and aristocratic families 
in this in, in London and then produced this cookery book and came through sections of the um, pastries and the sweets and he talks about uh, a compote of pears uh, and just the instructions he gives up peel the pears cut them down the middle and take out the core put about half a pound of sugar onto boil in about half a pint of water skim it until it is quite clear and then put a pint of port wine to it oh. <laughs> put the pears into a preserving pan and pour the sugar and wine over them and then Put in about two dozen of cloves. Wow! Yeah, exactly, just what I was thinking. Uh, cover them over with paper and let them boil gently until tender. They will take two hours. And that's one pretty hard, tough pears. Um, this quantity of sugar and wine will do for 12 pears. So, yeah, we might be inspired by a recipe, but sometimes, yes, two dozen. Clothes are, yeah, would be very, very spiced, even uh, for today's uh, interest in spicy foods. But um, the following recipe was for a trifle. And um, I've tried this, and it, I think it works well. So he's telling you really here to cut a few slices off a sponge cake, or Savoy cake as he calls it, um, and put them at the bottom of a trifle dish. He describes that as something like a salad dish in respect to depth, so a sort of shallow glass dish. Lay a layer of macaroons on them, and then a layer of uh, ratafia biscuits, um, and a pint of a sweet white wine over the cakes. Oh. Leave it long enough to soak all the wine up, and then cover the cakes with custard, made in the following manner. Uh, a quart of milk and cream mixed, and a little cinnamon, lemon peel and sugar. Uh, let it boil for half an hour, take it off the stove and put it to cool. To this quantity of milk and cream, put the yolks of eight eggs and a spoonful of flour. <laughs> Beat them up in a basin with a spoon very well and then you add the milk and make the custard. Um, and strain it through a hair sieve um, into the saucepan and stir it until it comes to the boil. And then when it's cold, you add a glass of brandy uh, <laughs> and a few spoonfuls of an almond liqueur. Oh, no. uh, and you cover cake. the cakes uh, with it. And then put a layer of apricot jam uh, on top of the oh. custard. Then put a pint of good cream in a basin. He's spelling basin, B-A-S-O-N. Um, with the white of an egg, a lump of sugar rubbed to a lemon, and about two glasses of white wine. Okay. <laughs> Eat it up with a whisk, um, and then uh, you put the whipped cream over the top of the, uh, the, the trifle. Um, and he suggests that you garnish the edge of the dish with preserved orange or dried orange peel. Um, again, perhaps we wouldn't make that exactly as he suggests, but, um, but the cream then. and the wine and the egg white in the cream does make it very, very light. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it would have been very fashionable in, in Regency in England. Regency. Kind of highly desirable dish, I think. Sorry, Anne. I just wondered what date is, is it? This is 1819. 1819. Yes. So it's 1819. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, if we sort of move on, I just look at a couple of things on the table. And um, I've mentioned Mrs. Beaton, and well, we know the name is still synonymous today, you know, Mrs. Beaton and her cookery yeah. books. Very clever collection of uh, recipes that subscribers, um, many of them sent to her. So you know, she compiled uh, the cookery book and went into many editions. Um, and I noticed that. Um, in the very early edition, first edition, Mrs. Beaton's, and then this is 1907, so quite so much later on, um, this edition, we still find um, Exeter pudding. I don't know if they tried Exeter pudding before. It dates to about the time of the Great Exhibition uh, in London, and in, in Exeter, and in the southwest at that time, there was a um, very interesting lots of agriculture and the produce uh, of food from mm. Devon and there was an agricultural, so you would say today, a you know, huge sort of conference um, and celebratory banquet held 
in Exeter and uh, the city wanted to make a great impression um, on people they'd invited to this uh, event and promoting food from Devon and West Country. So they engaged the celebrity chef of his day, Alexis Soyo, to come and oversee preparation of the banquet, um, which was served at various points within uh, the city, and Northern Ave um, Castle and gardens that were uh, triumphal arches and gas was used for cooking some of the, uh, the roast beef. Um, but he wanted a pudding uh, to be the, the crowning glory of, of the menu. So he, he came up with this Exeter pudding and um, the ingredients uh, are breadcrumbs, um, sponge cakes, um, sort of macaroons or ratafia biscuits, um, suet, um, moist brown sugar, uh, eggs, um, rum or, or brandy, um, cream, um, grated lemon rind, um, jam and sauce. Now, it was a, a mixture was layered with the sponge cakes and the, the macaroons, so you had this mixture of the breadcrumbs and the suet and the eggs, uh, which was layered, and then the, it was baked. So it wasn't a steamed pudding, but it's almost, when you think about it, the ingredients, many of the, of a trifle, but he decided he baked them. And apparently it was a great success. Um, and the, um, the Exeter papers reported the banquet, and they said that, uh, they described them as the matrons of Exeter were clamouring for the recipe. <laughs> so it ended up in Mrs. Beaton's uh, cookery book. Um, so they say, well into the 20th century. And... Um, Somewhere lurking here, we've, we've got a, an Exeter pudding, um, which is still warm, and later on I'll, I'll cut it up, you're welcome um, to try that. And see what you think. And the, the sauce that um, he gave the recipe for was a mixture of a black currant jam, was, that was used in the actual pudding, uh, again with some sherry or wine, uh, lemon juice uh, and water. So you, you added a little moisture and the flavour of the fruit uh, to this very, very uh, rich pudding. Best taken in, I say small doses, small, por <laughs> small portions, but it's a little taste of Victorian um, England really and a type of pudding that would have been it would have been very special at the time because there was still a sort of heavy tax on sugar and the ingredients mm -hmm. uh, were expensive and it would have been quite an impressive um, mm -hmm. sweet. Um, but something that could have been made at home without too many fancy uh, sort of utensils and the ingredients were quite easy to mix and uh, work together. So um, as we uh, look through the books, it's interesting, sort of a contrasting uh, sort of recipes for the rich and famous, and then um, recipes for everyday use. And this publication um, has been reprinted again from the, about the same era as the Exeter pudding. This is a plain cookery book for the working classes. <laughs> it seems, you know, it seems sort of patronising now, but I think it was well intentioned. Um, and this was okay, one of Queen Victoria's uh, chefs, Frank Latelli, who had produced this book that gave simple instructions as to how to make the best of, of very little. So making very simple soups and stews and broths, uh, food that was nourishing uh, and sustaining. Um, and it's, it's a contrast to maybe the uh, the the Regency book and the, uh, the, the Mrs. Beacon's book, but people were you know, considering those who didn't have as much sort of philanthropy in a way, but through through the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to have a, have a look at that in a moment. But I've uh, got a selection of books on the um, little bookshelf here, and we'll perhaps just dip into this one, and, well, as we sort of on a slightly sort of royal um, vein. Um, the Royal Chef, not exactly a cookery book, uh, but the story of a, of a chef um, who worked, first of all, for Queen Victoria. He was a um, young, 
came really as a, an apprentice to Buckingham Palace from Switzerland, um, Gabriel Schumi, and his um, sister worked for Queen Victoria's sort of household. She was a senior, had quite a senior position as a sort of dresser uh, to Queen Victoria, and somehow Queen Victoria got to know that this lady's um, brother was on his own after the parents had died, their parents had died in Switzerland. Um, and she arranged for him to come and work uh, in the royal household, and he stayed um, and worked not only for Queen Victoria but uh, was chef to Queen Alexandra um, and Queen Mary. And then, when he retired in the early 1950s, he uh, he wrote this account uh, of his his time. But he, he gives recipes uh, which are very very interesting. So um, he he talked about his time with Queen Victoria, who said, he said would occasionally send for him to see you know, was he all right, how is he getting on, what message would be sent. So she did keep, you know, kept him in mind. Um, and recipes from my service with Queen Victoria. Um, and um, he talks about Balmoral shortbread. Uh, Queen Victoria had a little of this almost every day. Apparently she had a, quite an appetite and right sweet, had a very sweet <laughs> um, And it's a very simple recipe for the um, shortbread. Well, three quarters of a pound of flour, half a pound of butter, quarter of a pound of sugar. Uh, I've made some so you can taste some in a moment just to see what you think. Um, and he says that um, you, know, you rub the butter and sugar on the board and then work in the flour with your fingertips. Um, and it was... Um, Treated them. They were always made in this, as, as they had done in Buckingham Palace, uh, the individual biscuits, and they had three rows like forked and three rows, almost in a domino pattern, and they had to be done that way uh, every day and served for uh, to Queen Victoria. And we go to Windsor uh, mince meat, the Buckingham Palace um, plum pudding. So the recipe he gives is sufficient for 150. Uh, small puddings weigh, <laughs> weighing two pounds each. So, just get the uh, flavour here: sixty pounds of flour, forty pounds of currants, raisins, and so on. Um, and there's a very good recipe for a Windsor Castle staff carrot pudding, um, which is almost like a, a Christmas pudding. Um, I have tried that; and that works. Well. Um, then he worked. Um, was in service with. King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra, um, and he, he talked about the um, the banquet, the, the coronation, sort of banquet for um, Edward VII. There's been a, there was a program on the weekend about Queen Alexandra. On, I don't know if any of you caught Ooh, that. Um, they did mention there that um, Edward VII had I think, appendicitis. Uh, was very ill before the proposed date for his his coronation. So the coronation was. Postponed and then it was uh, took place you know, a couple of months later. But uh, Gabriel says they prepared all the food for the banquet. Then it was cancelled, yeah. but it was distributed to the poor and needy uh, in London. Um, and he, he spoke very highly of uh, of Queen Alexandra. Um, with her, with her, she introduced Danish uh, dishes to the royal household. Um, but Queen Alexandra's birthday cake was a special event every year. Um, this was made um, regularly at Buckingham Palace from 1902 to 1910. Um, and well, it contains 40 eggs and three and a half pounds of butter and four pounds of uh, fine white sugar. Very rich, rich cake uh, that she, she liked. Apparently her favorite dish was poulet danois, that, um, chicken um, with a cream sauce. Then he worked for King George V um, and Queen Mary um, and he retired having worked um, for Queen Mary and said that she was perhaps slightly more distant as an employer than Queen Alexandra and Queen Victoria had been but there were frequent notes sent to him if she liked something then you know, that they wanted, she wanted to try that again. Mm -hmm. Uh, or if something she wasn't so happy about, there would be a little note 
I'm just advising him maybe not to serve that. <laughs> okay. um, and he talks about the um, well, King George VI's favourite lunch and dish was a Marlborough House omelette. Very mm -hmm. simple omelette with um, basically egg yolks um, and cream mixed together and then egg whites whisked and mixed into that mixture and cooked uh, in butter. Very, very simple food apparently uh, he, he likes. But it, it's an interesting reflection on that period really, that Victorian, Spanish Victorian um, era to post-war Britain in, 19, in the 1950s uh, when he retired. And yeah, the, some of the recipes yeah, might be interesting. It is interesting to try them and try some, and you know, you'll try something um, in a moment. Maybe. But while we're sort of in the 1950s, I um, uh, thought, well, we couldn't talk about sort of food really without uh, Bon Viveur or Fanny and John <laughs> yeah. uh, Now, I don't know if any of you um, remember Alison Leach, who lived here for a while, and she was. Uh, I think you would describe her as PA to, to Fanny Craddock um, for quite a few years, and she lived, you know, she told the story, um, and um, really said that uh, Fanny Craddock was a very innovative gardener uh, and very keen on growing unusual fruits and vegetables, um, almost sort of years ahead of her time, really. Um, but uh, as we know, she made an impression on, um, on television. Uh, with her, um, her cookery programs and this book from the 1950s is everything you needed to know about preserving food um, from your um, garden and uh, elsewhere. And I just noticed this um, recipe for Carlsbad plums. This is ridiculously simple and she had a turn of phrase I think they would agree. Um, and she says pack the best quality prunes loosely to the neck of a screw-top fitted jar. Cover with inexpensive cooking port and a two-ounce piece of, uh, well she calls it, um, brown crystal wine sugar, or brown sugar works just as well. Seal and leave for three months. The fruit swells and becomes impregnated with the wine and sugar and makes a superb dessert. Uh, especially for teetotal made nerves. <laughs> <laughs> and she always had a turn of phrase that she, she would make a comment. But uh, I've, it does work. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the illustrations are interesting too with uh, Fanny and Johnny. They're sort of stacking on the shelves with everything there, their fruit and uh, the vegetables that they bought. And she tells you know to buy things when the price is low, and then uh, can or bottle the peaches and fruit. Yeah, it's, it was good advice, but of the period. Um, um, let's just have a look. Sort of companion uh, volume here. It's a story behind um, these these books. <laughs> yeah. Really back, it's gone back to the 1930s, and um, a food writer, he didn't describe himself necessarily as a chef, um, he would have described himself as, as a cook and a food writer and a, and a restaurateur, and um, this was Marcel Boulestin, Boulestin. and um, he was an Anglophile, um, he lived in England from the very early 20th century um, and was passionate about French food and passionate really about introducing it to English households and um, he established a restaurant in London in Covent Garden, um, Bulestan, which was there until the probably the early 1980s and it was a very exclusive restaurant in its, especially in the 1920s and 30s. He employed the best interior designers, artists, um, the craftsmanship in the restaurant was apparently superb. Um, but he became well known as a, as a food writer. His, his cookery books were immensely popular in the 20s uh, and 30s. Um, and this uh, volume here is The Finer Cooking. Um, and it came into 
there were two volumes, they, they had two books, one for the lady of the house and one for the cook. So <laughs> I think you can guess which is which. <laughs> um, uh, but um, the, the ladies' uh, edition has um, line drawings, uh, very good illustrations uh, by Le Bourrier, uh, no illustrations in the cook's edition. But he talked about um, part, arranging parties uh, and entertaining. It's very much a book about being encouraging the lady of the house to, to really plan um, very successful um, and sophisticated lunches uh, and dinner parties. Um, and he, he, it just reflects on the way things were changing you know, in this period in the 1930s. Um, about uh, you know, in the Victorian era, invitations to begin with were properly issue, issued and properly accepted. Um, Mrs. Mornington Crescent, <laughs> we listened to a clue, I think, uh, for instance, would request the pleasure of Mr. Charles Street's company on the evening of the 14th of January, collation at 7 o'clock, quadrille at 9, uh, RSVP. And then he goes on to say that you know, that strictness and that formality uh, was changing, um, but the, he gives extensive notes on the duties of a hostess, planning the menu, selecting the dishes, um, so she could refer to the the recipes and then tell cook what it was, what the menu was, and where the recipes um, would be found. What I noticed in the back, towards the back of the book, was what he calls sundries, uh, was a cider punch. Um, and I think this would have been, we have to tell Barney Butterfield about this. <laughs> um, punch au cidre, uh, an extremely good drink can be made with cider, the draught cider being the best for this purpose. I put a quarter cider in a saucepan with a few lumps of sugar and three oranges stuck with cloves. Bring to the boil and boil for two or three minutes. And then a good glass of whiskey. Um, and serve very hot out of a bowl in which float the oranges. <laughs> a pretty sight, a good drink, a mixture more warming than most people would expect an in innocent looking cider drink to be. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some surprises that might be worth trying. Um, very nice recipe for um, iced coffee uh, with plenty of cream um, and vanilla to flavour it. Mm. And I noticed this. Yeah. He was well known so as a food writer, a restaurateur, and he was the first TV chef in, in Britain. So when the BBC um, started broadcasting from Alexandra Palace in 1936, he was the, uh, the chef uh, they employed. Um, and he also made um, a recording, um, which I have heard, I think it was on it was on YouTube for a while, uh, describing how he was demonstrating how to make an omelette. And he said that the language, that his, the way he wrote and his language was so, so good, you know, that, that, that this disc was issued of uh, making an omelette. But he gives um, instructions here, I'll just read it, it's a very brief, for making what he describes as an omelette picard, just to give you the flavour. This omelette is quite plain, and the secrets of its flavour is just a taste of the eggs and of the butter, which must both be perfectly fresh. The seasoning is only salt. The eggs are beaten as usual, a good piece of butter is put in the pan, and the moment it is melted, the eggs are put in. You stir occasionally with a fork, lifting the coagulating eggs so that the top um, is allowed to cook. When the eggs are set, the omelette is ready and served flat, so that it is unlike an ordinary omelette which is folded, and unlike a Spanish omelette which is flat but tossed. It is, in fact, as if scrambled eggs had been allowed to set as a whole. <laughs> and his, his, his recipes are very much in that vein, very clear instructions, mm -hmm. and um, really they were intended to be very, very practical. Uh, so. I think it's no reason, no wonder he was you know, so popular um, in his, his day. In the 1980s, there was a revival of his 
an interest in his work and um, a lot of his recipes were reissued um, but he actually had made references to recipes from Devon in uh, some of his books. There's just one I'll just mention here. It's like these books, you know, you look at a cookery book and there might, some of them might appear very tatty, grubby and stained, but there's very often a, a story, uh, more of a story to them. Um, the annotations and notes uh, that people add to them. This one um, is called A Second Helping or More Dishes for English Homes uh, by Marcel Brewerstone. Um, and the inscription, I took this to when I saw the, the book here, um, Evita Air, um, and this is 15 Kensington Palace Gardens. Well, I don't know if any of you know Kensington Palace and Kensington Palace Gardens, they are huge <laughs> um, mansions. February, February 1925, so um, whether she's written a little bit into the book Eve, so. Whether she was cooking there, I, I'm not sure, but uh, February the 24th, 1925. Um, but there are recipes from, from Devon, he talks about squab pie from Devonshire, Devonshire fried potatoes, uh, Devonshire junket, uh, salt fish. So whether he had visited Devon or these West Country dishes were popular, but it's very interesting that they were included um, in, in his book. So, yeah. It's an accolade maybe for, for Devonshire uh, cookery, uh, uh, something for us to think about there. I say you should never judge a book by its cover and its sort of seemingly sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of black, or sort of blue sort of, uh, book, but um, notice that the title is uh, Some Favourite Southern Recipes uh, of the Duchess of Windsor. Um, uh, he, so maybe somebody would readily associate her uh, Duchess of Windsor with a cookery book and some would suggest that she didn't spend a great deal of time uh, actually in the kitchen <laughs> but um, the story behind the book uh, is that um, when she and the Duke were uh, in the Bahamas um, this was part of her um, fundraising work uh, for the war effort so she uh, collected recipes that she'd become accustomed to uh, sort of growing up um, in, in the South. Um, and apparently she was uh, meticulous uh, in, in planning her, her meals and hospitality and as a hostess. And a lot of these recipes um, she served um, to her, her guests. I've just noticed that um, you know, we see more sweet potatoes uh, now in the... Um, in the shops. She gives a recipe for orange sweet potatoes. Um, cook the sweet potatoes in boiling salted water until tender, peel and slice and cover the bottom of a greased casserole with a layer of potatoes um, and repeat until the dish is full. And then you pour um, orange juice and pulp over the top, breadcrumbs on the top um, and bake. It yields approximately six portions. But um, maybe a slightly different way of thinking about uh, using um, sweet potatoes, mixing them with orange. They are, you could think of that possibly work, might work in a soup, you know, tomato and orange are sweet potatoes. But, so it's just a little uh, sort of curiosity in a way. Apparently the sales of the book uh, raised a considerable amount of money which they went to the uh, Royal Air Force uh, Fund from, from the Bahamas. And this I came across a little while ago, the um, recipes from Rawby, the, the mill on the, uh, the cover of the book. Um, and this is from a WI, um, in Rawby, a little village um, in Lincolnshire, which is famous still today. Apparently the mill has been recently restored. Population just under 2,000. Um, I just I was going through the book and saying, well, what are they, what are the recipes, what are they including? And one that I've made, and I've got some, you can try some here, is um, the beverages, wines, and syrup. Um, they give a, a instructions for making blackberry vinegar. 
um, and just a pound of blackberries, a pint of vinegar and sugar. Uh, soak the berries in vinegar and leave for five or six days. S squeeze and strain through muslin and add a pound of sugar to each pint of syrup and boil together for 10 minutes and bottle uh, for use. I've got some spoons and we'll pour some into the dish if you feel you'd like to try it, do so. I've, so I've made this before and the, it lasts very well. It just, it keeps for a long time and it's, it's like a much sweeter, I said balsamic vinegar, I'm not wrong, but you know, something that has a sweetness and sharpness and works well with, um, particularly with beetroot. Uh, and it's, it was an interesting little recipe. But then, again, something that's, so you never know what you're going to find, find in the books. Um, and on notes, a paper here that had come from um, Conservative Association in Lancaster Gate in London. Uh, and we know that M Miss Durrant, Westbourne Terrace, um, West. Uh, but we find the Spanish recipe for quince, quince jelly. Um, and um, quince in syrup and uh, quince paste. Now this year was a very good year, I don't know if you've got quince trees at home, but they had masses uh, at home. Um, so the, um, the quince paste or membrio, uh, the instructions here, um, she says, yeah, very good for cut, cutting, yeah, it's every, every detail is uh, I've made some on the um, little dish. You, you're welcome to try some. There are some samples if you wish to take some of the uh, the rest, some away. But you never know what's going to turn up in the, these books. Mm -hmm. and those that really perhaps are the more interest, that have an interest, they have take more of a story to them. Someone's used them, uh, maybe not for a long time, um, but they're part of that uh, sort of that food story. Ways and Means in a Devonshire Village, which I've um, now used uh, for several years, by Mrs. Cruz Charland. Um, this was publication from the 1880s. Mrs. Cruz Charland um, produced her book. It's not a cookery book as such, um, but it was a series of um, 12 or so readings uh, designed to be um, delivered at women's sort of happy hours, as they were called, sort of like that, <laughs> in the afternoon. And each story had, there was a moral to each story. It was really about, uh, there were lessons in frugality and uh, making the most of what very limited means you, know, you, you might have had, how to feed your family. They were giving instructions, but it's told through a sort of story um, of more experienced housewife living in a, a small village, could be anywhere here uh, in Devon or anywhere you know, in rural areas. Um, more experienced housewife who at one time had worked at the big house and then she's befriended her neighbour whose husband works uh, on, on the farm and she's giving her instructions as to how to make the best of, of very little. Um, so, for example, um, talks about making um, potato cake. Now, isn't Deb mm -hmm. familiar with potato cake? Yes. Um, now for potato cake number two. She gives her two recipes, uh, said Mary, and that's the one that my children like the best. It's more in their line being sweet, um, and she tells you to take a pound of flour, half a pound of cold potatoes mashed, with the hard bits picked out, <laughs> about six ounces of dripping, half a pound of currants, a small teaspoonful of baking powder, and enough water to moisten it, but don't mix it too wet, um, and then to bake that cake, um, which was versions of that were staples uh, in many households, just a way of using up some potatoes, making something that was, well, wasn't too sweet or rich, but just ingredients from a store cupboard um, that would have provided something um, sweet um, for, for tea time, especially for children. She also talks about um, salt fish, which for many people living in the country was the only readily available source of fish where you know, deliveries of fresh fish would have been very difficult or 
very sporadic. Um, and um, soaking that uh, overnight and then uh, frying the salt fish and then frying it and serving it with bacon, um, which is something you don't see very much. Uh, you, occasionally, you can buy it in a fish shop in fishes in Exeter, sell salt fish, uh, but it's, it's not something we tend to see so much now, but it was a staple really um, here. Um, and the book is sort of peppered in a way with for recipes, instructions, but very typical of what a Devonshire household um, would have been eating, what would have been on the table. Um, and in an interesting way of passing that information on, and maybe drawing the lessons from a community where, you know, we, did, we talked about the recipes, not exactly writing them down, but she's telling her how to make those simple dishes uh, and to look after, especially to look after the, hus the husband and the meat broth. Well, the meat was given to the husband and the broth to the children. And the family. But there, there we are. Yeah, and that was 18 weeks ago, seven and a half weeks ago. And we haven't had anything. What are we doing for time? Would they have um, salted the fish themselves or would they have. No, it was. Um, came in ready, salted oh, and right. dried. Yes. Um, it, it was, um, yes. Bacala, the, the, really that, that style of fish. And occasionally Jenny Pitts used to sell it. So, so the nine, maybe well into the 1990s, and then uh, you know, it became difficult for her to get yes. it. And here it was especially popular around so Easter time mm -hmm. uh, and a Good Friday dish. And apparently in the royal household, when Queen Mary in her day, it was always served for lunch. To her on um, on Good Friday, mm. with um, or steamed uh, with boiled potatoes, parsnips, and an egg sauce. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. yes, it's again one of those things that maybe has slipped out of mm. fashion as, as we were using it. Once uh, fridges and things freezes, it didn't need to be preserved. Yes. Absolutely, yes. So I think, yes, things, yes, it, it sort of moves. It moves on, um, and as we look at some of the some of the books, yes, some of the ingredients and some of the amounts of fat and salt and sugar. We, yes, we always have, we would question those today, but you have to you know, look at them in the context of, of, of the time. Um, the other thing we also sort of touched on here in. Uh, Looking at Devon, another example is the uh, manual of a vegetarian cookery, mm -hmm. which was um, published in 1908, Ooh. and that was from a, a hotel on um, a, a Bellstone, the Dartmoor House. Um, I can just find the point of that, Jane. Yeah, um, the house is still there as you drive into um, to Bellstone. Um, and it was a vegetarian hotel from uh, sort of late 1890s up to around the First World War, and it was established by a doctor, Dr. Black, who had um, come to Devon to improve his own health. He was a medical officer for health in Keswick, and um, not sure exactly what the problem was, but he was advised. Well, you know, to improve your health, go to the southwest, go to Devon, and go to Torquay. So he came to Torquay and found that the air, the climate, purity of the water you know, did improve his health. Um, and he wrote extensively for the uh, for the Torquay Council, advising them how you know, to encourage people to come to Torquay to improve their health. Um, but he established his vegetarian hotel um, at Bellstone, and. Um, he says, um, for several years I had a vegetarian house at Bellstone on Dartmoor, um, and during the greater part of that the time I had the services as manageress of one who displayed an unusual aptitude for cooking, and that was Miss Isabel Densham. Um, and he, he says he, can't, he couldn't take credit for the recipes, but it was Miss Densham um, who was, you know, was the cook, so he gives her credit for those. 
but he advocated so that the advantages of a vegetarian diet. So from looking into the, the book, all the recipes are there. So for at least minimum of a three week cycle of menus um, and then menus. And um, they use a lot of nice deadened ingredients. Um, there was quite a lot of butter and milk and sort of eggs and, and cream and local um, vegetables. Um, and Dr. Black, then similar era to a Dr. Oldfield in Paynton, who was mm -hmm. advising what we might think of as a vegan diet and uh, system uh, for health cures around the same time, um, and numerous other advertisements for ho vegetarian hotels and establishments in and around South Devon, especially, uh, were noted in this publication. I think I'm correct in saying it's the first hotel cookery book published in, in Devon. Mm -hmm. uh, so it predates um, many others that are, who have followed since. But um, it's, it's just a really interesting story. It's again sort of a changing attitude to health and remedies for health through your diet at that time. Another one sort of good, okay, so was given to me is this publication of a, a, a group, a green umbrella group. This is uh, from Essex who produced recipes. It's another similar sort of theme, but in the 1980s, so you see that's that sort of occurring um, again. So we could go on and on really looking at um, some of those recipes and stories, but what I was interested in also was just to, from you, are the books that you go back to again and again, or, or recipes, where did they come from? Who, Where do you get them to them? It's very easy to go on YouTube, or online, on the internet. Some it's BBC, sort of cookery recipes, but maybe we're miss, maybe perhaps missing out on sort of experience on, on somehow looking at some of these other books. Well, what do you use? Do you have, anyone have a particular sort of favourite? Well, I've always cut out recipes, oh, right. and I've got four different scrapbooks Brilliant. of recipes that I've always cut out. Brilliant, yes. And I still use a lot of them. You go back, yes, yeah, some you go back to. Oh, yes. Yes, yes there was Harold Walshaw in The Guardian. Yeah. When we first, I think, first married. And uh, I cut out a lot of his recipes. And right. Them. Yeah. And so those those books almost form a story then of your yes. your. Your cooking uh, yes. <laughs> yes, and there was the Delia started uh, writing, putting recipes in Radio Times. Yes. And I cut those out. Yes, and some of them. And, and put yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. And other ones that you go back to again. Yes. Again. Yes. yes, there are. Yes. Right. Does anyone else do do that? Anne, you said you keep um, scrapbooks or yes, yeah, scrapbooks. I, and I also I always make the apple pie that my mother watched her make every day when I was a child. And it's not the same as you're getting the rest of it. No. Uh, yeah. so, so, yes, again, something that you would have shared yes. with. Because I've watched her doing everything, yes. But I do, yes, I do cut out and, and copy things out. Mm. When are you going to write your book? Well, that's <laughs> 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 Yeah, there's one, I think it's from the 1970s, in Marks and Spencer's. French bistro cooking, and it was, you know, very much of that era. But I go back to it time and time again, and especially a lot of the the main sort of meals can be done in a slow cooker, um, and it, it's it's just a backbone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any others? Is it? That one, Paul. Oh. Can I go back to a lot? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, show, and then I'll come on. Yeah, come when on. I was doing my domestic science GCSE <laughs> back yeah. in the day, um, I bought the Reader's Digest Cookery Year, which I still use a lot, and the covers are falling off, and there's drips and stains <laughs> and things all over it. Because I bought that too. Yeah. Yeah. My yes, grandmother gave it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Pauline has just passed this. this one. It's a WI one. Uh, the w, yeah. From 1948. Mm. Gleaning from Gloucestershire Housewives. Yeah. Published by Gloucester's Federation of Women's Institutes. And a first edition. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 
And do you use this one? I do occasionally, yeah. yes. I'm stuck for something. I can usually find it in there. Yeah. That was my mother, my mother-in-law's. Ah, uh, again, something you see it's passed on, it's got, it's to, yeah. Just that we've got a Ritz cream here, so, yeah. And it's nice to you've got, um, you know where they, the recipes have come from, so it's mm. a name, a person, um, and a place, yeah. Was just something I've you know, an observation. Um, if you look at many of the books that are published today, there's usually they're probably heavier on full page illustrations mm -hmm. on, on a saucepan or a bunch of leaks or something. But in these you know, sometimes very limited illustrations or, or none at all. Mm -hmm. So you to use your yeah, imagination, mm -hmm. you, you worked from from the, uh, the recipe. Mm -hmm. And I can see you've put some notes in here as well. Yeah. And they're not all my you, notes. They're not, no. no. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other books that you've said? I've got a 1983 Women Weekly um, cooking book. That's the year I got married. Yes. And, um, you know, had things like the time you had to cook the different meats as you were roasting them. And how to cook a Christmas dinner, you know. So he knew how I had been cooking, but it's a very different thing if you're going to start cooking for your husband and his family. <laughs> yeah. and, um, I still have it and still use it. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any other? Uh, I write. I find a recipe that I like, and I write it in my own cookbook. I'm, I've got a book that I write all the favourite yeah. recipes in that I constantly go back to again. And I've also got the Farmer's Weekly. Um, cookery book and that has got everything you can think of in it. It's just amazing. Yeah. You know, you you've got some spare carrots, so you turn to that one and you find somebody doing something Sorry. amazing <laughs> with um, spare carrots. That's yeah. And what about the the internet? Did you think? Yeah. 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 I cooked some squid the other night, and and I looked. Up because I was sure that the squid had just flashed by it, and I was I was right. And yeah. Yeah. But I hadn't got that in any of the books. I don't think. Yeah. And a lot of the books, um, the old books, they don't have things for avocado and and, and things that no, are that, what, used yeah. now that weren't around. Yeah. yeah. Butternut squash and. That, that that's right. So mm. some of, so say the, so that they. they like, like represent a story of what we've eaten um, and um, that changes for all sorts of reasons over time so sort of, I think yeah while we still yeah we look for something you know a new recipe or a new instruction because mm. it's, and maybe another way of putting um, of ingredients together that um, cha the changes and the flavors that are put together today and the, the way but sometimes even looking at the uh, some of the format, the illustrations in the books, you see how the style of um, presentation of food has changed. Mm -hmm. I can't, didn't bring it today, we just so many you could bring, but so, someone mentioned Delia Smith, yeah, yes. yeah. and looking at, um, I think it was the 1980s, but the, uh, and the illustrations maybe are so different to um, pictures you yeah, all my, all my Delia Smiths yeah. haven't got any illustrations in there. Yeah. They're, um, they're the first ones, the first ones. three volumes. Right. Mm. But again, hugely popular in, in, and very workable recipes, yes. very, very reliable. Very, very nice. Um, yes. I'm, yeah, I've, so, I could, so many I could, I could have picked out, but um, another writer who uh, yeah, was, again, prolific, so the 50s and 60s with Margaret Patton. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. My mother gave me yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Who, the Yes, and she is yeah, a pioneer of um, you know, promoting you know, sensible cooking and good instruction, clear instruction through her work for the Ministry of Food. And she also used to demonstrate in Harrods. So she was, um, I think, but very keen and sort of amateur of dramatics. I think she said that helped her with her sort of presentation, and she uh, ran a Ministry of Food cookery 
sort of bureau and demonstration uh, in Harrods, and she, her first publication was a, a cookery book for, for Harrods. Um, but again, always very clear instructions, and I think you, you knew you'd go to her, but it would, the recipe would work. Mm. Um, mm. Not pretentious in any way, but you know, the instructions were very, very good, yeah. communicated uh, very well. Um, I think one of the nice, uh, occasionally, if there's a glut of plums, you make a plum chutney for a recipe that she gave. And it was so simple, you know, the instructions were so clear, and the nicest rich plum chutney you can imagine. But mm. yes, you find that, uh, again, those names that you're mentioning. A particular period, the names of an era. The, well, the two fat ladies I just brought that down there, they were, I think they broke the mold <laughs> of cookery programs. Uh, completely different uh, style of some other one. Something else I always do is if I use a recipe in a book from a book, I put the date in pencil when I did it and then I put delicious or must do this again or horrible or it took all morning to make or some yeah. some little comment like yeah, that yeah. which in years when you look back at it you think gosh did I make that then and, uh, yeah. and, yeah. and, 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 and it's sort of like a diary of, of what mm -hmm. when you cook yeah. things I well like you have mentioned I um, got a couple of scrapbooks so I found um, over the years people in the family had given me cookery books on notes and I thought, well, I don't want to lose these, so I, I, I pasted them into a, a scrapbook. And again, it's, it, you, it's, sometimes it's handwriting. Yes. It's a handwriting, isn't it? Yes. And then the language yes. um, changes over time. And some of the terms in those older books, mm -hmm. uh, I think perhaps we don't use, mm. but strewing, um, mm. you know, breadcrumbs or, or whatever, where they talk about baking something in a quick oven or a falling oven. You think, well, yeah. <laughs> to think for a minute, what exactly did they mean? But yes, there's a whole sort of story uh, mm -hmm. there. But I think, yeah, keeping a little scrapbook. And it's very interesting that you put the, having the dates so you know when you made them. Yeah. And the other thing I noticed um, from my grandmother's book, that very often she would know, she's added a recipe and then she said, well, Mrs. Davy, so you know that Mrs. Davy had given her that recipe or there's some, there's a connection. Um, there's a meaning there, isn't there, for yeah. another story. What about sort of current sort of cookery programmes or, or I find some of the really modern cookery books are not written in a very um, easy way to follow, you know, they're right. written a bit bit too texty sometimes, you know, the way the recipes are written down and the instructions are a bit, you know, you just need a few words to tell sometimes you what to do right. next, really. Yeah. Mm. And any of the particular programmes do you, you watch? Keep your food? Mm. Mary, Berry. <laughs> Mary Berry. Mary <laughs> Berry. I don't watch the Bake Off. The Bake Off, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mary <laughs> by Chris. The people presenting, wasn't the food, mm. Nigella. Jamie Oliver with his fish bash oh, box. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose it's that celebrification, is it sometimes mm. referred to? Mm. Of it, yes. Mm. Um, and they become hugely commercial sort of ventures in their own right. Um, yeah, and sort of the media exposure that wasn't there previously. I mean, they've had. Mm. Yeah, re recipes broadcast on the radio and mm. some Marcel Boulestin for a very short time in the 1930s on television to a very, very limited audience. But yeah, exposure uh, today and on the mm. internet. Um, It'd be an interesting follow-up to see how many people actually use the recipes of those celebrity chefs yeah. or whatever and, and how, how it actually affects our health and our well-being. Yeah. And, we're supposed to be being more careful about food, but we're being bombarded all the time by, te if you're mm -hmm. into television, of watching all of those yeah. programs. Does that do any good for our yeah. diet or mm -hmm. healthy living? And I wonder sometimes there are very mixed messages. And yes. It, yeah, whether it does. What, what, what do you find? I mean, do you find what um, any of the cooks that you 
don't like because you disagree with them, or do you have a, have you got a favourite? Um, I suppose a favourite from a few years ago, the 1970s and 1980s in particular, um, was Anton Mosserman, huh? and um, he came to um, England from from Switzerland, and. Uh, so sort of met him on a couple of occasions and he had sort of brought a lot of change with him when food was changing from a very traditional um, form of cookery and menu uh, to the, what was known for a long time as Nouvelle Cuisine and he introduced an element of well, his version of that um, to the Dorchester Hotel in London and then was, he was hugely influential, but I've always thought he was an extremely good communicator. Um, and his publications, books were very good, very easy, not sorry, easy to follow, they were very well written. Um, and not the flamboyant personality, it was more he was more passionate about the actual sort of food and in making a change and in making, making. A change for good it wasn't so much about a, I think a, a celebrity uh, sort of culture. So he he was influential. Um, the other book I didn't again didn't bring um, was a standard cookery book, I suppose, up until the nineteen eighties for um, larger sort of houses and hotels, and that was Escoffier, French chef, and. Yes, a lot of the dishes you wouldn't cook today. I mean, the instructions he gives for making turtle soup, well, no, we <laughs> don't go there. But most of the, the recipes, they were so well written, and they would work today, and he was responsible for, really for the style of... Certainly all the hotel and restaurant food and influence what we're eating today. Well, not only in the UK, but throughout Europe. Europe so standardised a lot of food, um, some recipes, food production in the very early 20th century. But the, the books are he, he get very, that he wrote, they're very well written. He wrote one for the for a professional chef and then produced a version for households, um, which very, very similar, but they scaled down ingredients and changed the language somewhat. But, yeah. If you had to prepare a three-course menu, yeah. what would you prepare for? <laughs> um, probably try and use, now, it make more of a point of using, making sure it's seasonal and it's local. So possibly a, uh, at this time of year, uh, a soup of some form, maybe a carrot soup, something uh, with some rice in it. Um, maybe fish is the main course, no more fish than, than meat, um, and a, but a good pudding. Good exit of pudding. Good, maybe an exit of pudding, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, well, I'll, I'll put out some of the biscuits, and if anyone would like to try. Any of the um, items come up, please do have a look. Um, there's some spoons. You're welcome to try. Mm -hmm.